Brooklyn Independent Television. Caught in the Act is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Coming up. Hey, you're my cougar, you're my hot chocolate cougar, and I'm burning because I love you all the time. What? American Candy, Fort Greene's very own sketch comedy troupe. In rehearsal, working toward the big laugh. Use your right hand so that the gun is here, and when you turn around, it's like boom, 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 boom. Oh, okay. Yes. Ward Williams charts a career with the cello and finds there's plenty of work playing with others. From Tehran to Brooklyn, Sinu Ghadarzi carries on the ancient and serene art of Persian calligraphy. Which, uh, as soon as I pick up this uh, pen and start writing, uh, it's, like a, it's like a yoga, it's a meditation. You say, hey, come on and hang out at the Superfund site that has a sewage overflow. I think not a lot of New Yorkers would really go for that. At Newtown Creek, three artists use a fleet of toy boats to get people thinking about pollution. Then let's ask him for a race. And with the line, with the... for Artem Morolovich, it was a near-fatal incident when he was a teenager that drove him to focus on art. And I realized at that point that life is too short and too serious of a thing to waste. They're all caught in the act. Art in Brooklyn. American Candy is a um, sketch comedy show, so it's got the heart of Carol Burnett and the sass and edge of In Living Color, and we are crackalicious sketch comedy. Baby, you're my cougar, you're my hot chocolate cougar, and I'm burning because I love you all the time. What? I know you are much older, but I like a girl that's bolder because a woman ages like a fine wine. You've been noticing just how I check you out. No. Write down your number so that I can give a shout. We work with between four and six writers, depending on the show. I act in a lot of stuff that I write and also stuff that I don't write. And to me, it's... For me, it's very interesting because all of our writers have been writing with us for a while yeah. now. There's no, we don't have any new writers, so when they cast things, we know exactly who they're casting and who they're writing about. It, for me, it's relaxing to be in a sketch that I'm not directing or that I didn't write. Is this the Celebrity STD Clinic? What else would it be, your old bat? Gray. Deal vagina. At least I have one, you trendy! I'm in a sketch that I'm writing and directing. I have to really, my game has to be three times tighter. Three times as tight, tighter. Same thing. So it's really about how you feel about each person. Okay. Like, do you not like Macy Gray? Because you, you know, your security guy shot her. Shot her, yeah. You know, you might think it's funny. <laughs> you know, how's your leg? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, read it many, many times to understand what's happening and what the writer is intending. Um, and then I just go and do a breakdown, much the same way that I would as an actor. Where are the beats? What, what do we need to be covering? What's important here? Um, Use your right hand so that the gun is here, and when you turn around, it's like boom, 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 boom. Oh, okay. Yes. Do one of these. Yes. Okay. Um, how can these people, characters, uh, interact to? get the funniest moments. Okay, so if you turn the lamp on, for example, um, the setting is uh, a recording studio, and there'll be headphones and things where Dr. Dre is uh, talking to uh, an imaginary camera person, and each singer comes in and has a little interchange with Dre and then they go to do the song and he then directs them um, how he wants the song to go and people are either compliant or not. Oh, here it is. 
with the cake. Pretty soon anyway, serving water at Jade, stop Jane's heart. I want to get more common kids' names. Well, for Kiki and Jane, it's um, it's pop culture commentary, and so. But even though I write it, we have to really collaborate on that a whole lot. Ava is really popular. That's another one now. of my kids' friends. Oh Jesus. Um, what else? Um, like she's a she's a friend. She's a Janaya and a Sanjaya. And a Javaya. Yeah. That Nevea, that stripper name. Heaven. Heaven backwards. Shut up. You, you think I'm lying? Shut up. No, you think I'm lying. Nevea always oh, is, is your family member. Shut up. Is this a family member? No. <laughs> Pretty soon, all they're going to be serving at kids' parties is water. Because a little bit of cake might stop Jaden or Isabella or Nevea's heart. Nevea? Yes, that's. Heaven, spelled backwards. <laughs> Don't get me started with these kids' names. Yes, get some black friends. Yeah, and then get some black friends is um, our song. Is our song and our our three big singers in the show. Woohoo! Yes, me, Holly, and Shelly. Shelly uh, My parents had a dream. Yeah, just like Dr. King had to visit everything to best schools, and there I met you. And you became my best friend. We were ride until the end, moved into the city, but I know it's big. I'm your only black friend. Yes, I am the only one in a place with 10 million people. Half of them Latino, all the Brooklyn baby. Do you have a fear of us? It's not that serious. Nervous though. Do you? I do. I get nervous. I don't, I'm never nervous about getting some black friends. I get nervous. I feel like that's in my bones now. Get yourself some black friends. Pour the Greek and the big hands in a place with 10 million people. Half of them Latino, all of Brooklyn, baby. Do you have a fear of us? It's not that serious. Just look down the bottom and over out. Give a little smile. Talk about Obama. Get some black friends. Hey, come on and hang out at the super fun site that has a sewage overflow. I think not a lot of New Yorkers would really go for that. The Newtown Creek Armada has a fleet of nine remote control model boats. Morgan, if you just want to try this to make sure it's working. They're all made using materials we've found along the Newtown Creek um, and in the area that we feel represent the past, present, and future of the creek having the boats and having a way to kind of interact in a fun way, playfully interact, is a good way to start sort of addressing some of these issues. It was great today at our launch to see these crowds of people, many of whom had never been out to the Newtown Creek Nature Walk or been on the Newtown Creek, uh, coming out and, and having, in some ways, a fun time in this polluted environment. We have the trash boat. There is a shipbuilding in Brooklyn anymore. Right? Yeah, right? We've also got the digester, which uh, has sort of an homage to the, the large digester eggs of the um, wastewater treatment plant. Um, we've got the oil boat, which um, represents the Greenpoint oil spill, which uh, still affects the Newtown Creek a lot. Which is like the second largest oil spill in the United States, and it's, it's underneath Greenpoint, leaking into the Newtown Creek. The Newtown Creek is still a little unknown to a lot of people living around it because it's harder to access. There's still a lot more active industry that block access to the waterfront there. So really, um, we met people during the course of our project who lived a few blocks away and they were like, oh, what is the Newtown Creek? Where is the Newtown Creek? Do you guys know the digester? Yeah. How does that 
one of the goals really is to have people in some ways embrace their their local waterfront and get to know it in, in a little in a little better way. The Newtown Creek is a super fun site, and so it's just a good idea when you're around the Newtown Creek to wash your hands if you touch the water. Uh, the other thing is that the Newtown Creek is a sewage overflow, right, which means that sometimes it's, there's potential for raw sewage to go in the water. So that's why we wear gloves when we touch the boats which have been in the water, and we wash all the boats at the end of the day to make sure that um, you know, they're safe for us to handle again the next time. This project really overlapped with a lot of our individual interests, like Nate has documented the waterfront and does a lot of urban exploration documentation, and I've done documentation of pollution before, and Sarah has engaged a lot with industry and sort of looking at that in public art. I think it's good for people to understand the, how things work, like where food comes from, where waste is processed, because I think it sort of makes everything a little less abstract to them, and if it's less abstract, then you care more and you think more about, you know, where your trash goes when you throw it away, or or other things like that. I want to see the that boy one. Lucas. Then let's ask him for a race. I got good pilot. And if it I want over, it. I just think that's not maybe an everyday experience for a little kid. And again, to sort of encourage this understanding from an early age, I think could be a great thing. I think we were all just really pleased with. Uh, you know, the feeling of uh, community that happened there. People, you know, seem to be talking to each other and enjoying the creek and, um, you know, getting invested in, I think, the way we all hoped for. The return of nature is, has been a pretty remarkable thing to observe on the Newtown Creek. Um, on our voyages, we've seen all kinds of wildlife along the edges of the creek and in the water. And even today, you can see evidence of, of some life returning to the water there. I think most people were actually surprised at how beautiful uh, the Newtown Creek Nature Walk is. And it's not just the nature that's beautiful, though the nature is lovely, um, but it's sort of the interplay of the nature, the infrastructure, you know, the wastewater treatment plant architecture, the barges with scrap metal that you see across, just sort of this like rich intersection of all these different important aspects of New York City. The garbage one is the fastest is one on that side. Yeah, it's really, really fast. Yeah, thank you so much. That was incredible. My name is Ward Williams and I play cello and guitar. I'm from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, grew up there. I think I've been in a band of some type pretty much nonstop ever since I was in sixth grade and started my first band. After school, I was in a band for 12 years called Jump Little Children that was based out of Charleston, South Carolina, and I played cello and guitar and sang back up with them. Every time we would come through New York, we would stay in Brooklyn with friends of ours. And I just really fell in love with the city. When the band ended in 2005, I was ready to move to New York. And I feel pretty lucky since I've been here because it seems like a lot of singer-songwriters and people who are in the pop world are really wanting more cello these days. So I found myself in the fortunate position of being really busy. I've been playing just being a side guy with a lot of different singer-songwriters. I feel like most of my creativity is sort of focused on just playing well and being a good backup musician. How am I doing? The, the green light is, is green. That's right, That's that means it's in tune. Oh, okay. You're, this you're, one is red, it's not good. You're by far the best tune I had today. Oh. <laughs> That's because you didn't teach today. Everything about these situations is surprise. I had almost given up looking into people's eyes. With Rachel Sage, I've been playing with her uh, for this year, pretty much. Rachel played Lilith Fair, and so she's been very active with a lot of the artists who were, who were in Lilith Fair. She just released her 10th record. So she's been going at it for, you know, for a long time. And actually, I think that her career and my career have been very, had a lot of parallels in terms of when, when we got started. And so I feel like we've seen a lot of the same changes in the music business.
My name is Rachel Sage. I am a live performer and a composer. I love Ward Williams because he is not only one of the most naturally gifted musicians that I've ever encountered, he's an extraordinary um, multi-instrumentalist, a wonderful cellist, and a fantastic guitarist, as well as a very proficient singer. Um, but he's also really, really funny on stage, and he's just, you know, so spontaneous, which is important with my work because I never like to do anything the same way twice. So we get along really well because he doesn't like to write anything down or to take notes. <laughs> so unlike other musicians with whom I've worked, he doesn't write chord charts, he just listens. Mm. He listens to me play a song once or twice, and in his magical, mystical brain of his, it all somehow takes hold and makes sense, and he's able to come up with you know, just really supportive accompaniment, and then also surprise me on stage every night with new twists on everything that we're playing together. So it's been a, an incredible adventure, and I know we're just getting started. Classical training sort of honed a lot of my skills and improved my ear. And being in Jump Little Children was also great training in terms of, you know, figuring out how to put cello into a band situation. Touring band was my first job with Jump Little Children. And so it's very comfortable just getting back out on the road and getting to meet a bunch of different people and play a lot of different venues. And, and it's been exciting just learning Rachel's music. And a lot of times when we play, it's just her and I. So there's, I'm finding, there's a temptation to sort of overplay when it's just the two of us, but I'm learning with her and with others, but how keeping just a really simple, beautiful part can really make a bigger impact than playing a whole bunch of notes. And of course there are times when I get to play a bunch, which is fun too, but it's just generally speaking in terms of fitting in with the song. It's like picking a couple of different notes and choosing where those go wisely and it's, it's a lot of fun. Whereas with music, I feel pretty comfortable saying that it'll be a challenge to me for the rest of my life. And so I think that's a good career choice. In a um, traditional sense, the uh, old calligraphers, they say cutting a pen, uh, it's like getting a bride ready from, for a wedding because it takes a lot of time. Well, since uh, early ages, I had a uh, special attention to the words and letters, only to the shape of them, not the meaning of them. I was really amazed by these shapes and you know how they look like and you know how do they kind of connect to each other, how do they join each other.
important for me to practice this art, especially as far as tools and approach to doing that in a very traditional format. Because I feel I need a break from the uh, digital uh, life, which uh, as soon as I pick up this uh, pen and start writing, uh, it's like a it's like a yoga, it's a meditation that it would shut off all of my extensions. I guess in every subject, when you learn something, you're responsible to pass it on. But calligraphy, the responsibility is different because it's a chest-to-chest -chest process. So the responsibility is heavier on your shoulder to pass it on. And this responsibility doesn't make any difference where I am. I mean, there have been Iran or Brooklyn or um, somewhere else. But the fact that it makes it different here in the United States, um, and there is a misconception about this art because this is a, like a pure fine art form in Iran. While it gets evaluated comparable to calligraphy in the West, which is mostly a craft. So this responsibility is different on my shoulder. So maybe it's additional responsibility. I not only have to pass on the, the torch to the next generation or next people, but I have to kind of fight to create or to provide that um, image of the reality of this art form for the Western audiences. Kist that in Shah Keumast Nist. It's uh, from Rumi, and um, the translation it reads from right to left. Kist that in Shah Keumast Nist. It says, translation is who is in this town. Uh, is there anybody not drunk in this town? Ever since I remember myself, I, I was drawing, like through, through my childhood, through my uh, school, high school, uh, when I was 17, I had a near-death experience. I, I was stabbed in a street fight in Russia, and I almost died. The doctor who was taking me to the hospital told me to save your energy because you're either going to die or you will be crippled for the rest of your life. And that was about a minute before I saw the light at the end of the tunnel, and I realized at that point that life is too short and too serious of a thing to waste, which really turned my life around and decided to take my talent seriously and dedicate my life to art. What happened after was kind of uh, like a fairy tale, because once I made that decision, everything kind of fell in place. Shortly after that incident, we moved to the United States, and while I lived in Russia, I never thought I considered an art career seriously. First of all, because it was the 90s, and it was just a crazy world that turned upside down. My whole family moved to the States and we moved to Buffalo, which is a small town upstate. And I was very lucky. I uh, had a wonderful art teacher. I uh, put a portfolio together, I applied to School of Visual Arts, and I got in on the first day and they gave me a full scholarship. A lot of my inspiration comes from mythology and even religious stories, so to speak. So, sort of a combined image of uh, Noah's Ark and uh, Flying Dutchman and kind of uh, image of our civilization as a as a ship, you know, something that's afloat and very 
uh, strong and you know very technically advanced and then one day you come home and it's not there. Also another theme that runs through my uh, art is the tree of life. In 98, I took an exchange semester in the Ritfield Art Academy of Amsterdam, which was a wonderful experience, and that's where I first was introduced to etching, which is the medium that I feel very passionate about now. It's a very rigorous and complicated process, but once you know all the technical details, you can, uh, you can express yourself uh, in various forms, just with the, with the line and with the fades, I just like the process, I like the, the fact that the process actually hasn't really changed in the last 500 years. And I like that hands-on making your artwork. And uh, here we have it. So this is all the stages that I had to uh, go through to get to where I'm at now, uh, with all the details and depth of field. Uh, and it's actually stage number 10 right now, and I might have to do one or two more stages to get the etching finalized. I work in different mediums, and uh, one of my latest, most favorite ones is uh, wire. For me, it's a continuation of etching. It's kind of a three-dimensional drawing in space. I'm on the right path. It's not an easy path, but you know, I definitely know that it's the right path for me. Watch this and other Brooklyn Independent Television episodes online at brickartsmedia.org slash BIT.